Well, from the looks of things, they want me to hurry up. Before I begin this evening, let me uh, make one other announcement. Uh, Jack Ross is not doing well. Uh, he got a, a pill lodged in his throat last night and is having trouble swallowing, having to pump his lungs uh, very often and may have to go to the ER requesting our prayers, and certainly we want to do that at this time. Let's go to our Father in prayer, please. Father in heaven, we bow before you this evening. We ask in a very special way that you be with Jack Ross and be with, with Jerry. Father, Jack has been through so much, and he's such a fighter, such an inspiration to all of us. It's a very difficult time, and Jerry's been at his side each and every step of the way. And Father, their love for each other is evident as their love for you is so evident. Be with Jack as only you can. And if he does need to go to the emergency room, be with the doctors and nurses there. And Father, be with him that he can recover his health. Be back with us, worshiping with us. It's always fantastic when he is here. As always, we ask that you forgive us of our sins. Be with us that we encourage each other on toward the goal. It's our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> so again, we're going to get to part two of this. Can uh, one sin or will un one unrepented sin shut the doors of heaven for us? And as I mentioned this morning, you know, there, there are some who would say, well, now wait a minute. Uh, the, and I'll, I'll get, if we get to it, I'll get to it later on this evening. But uh, some people say, well, Brother Smith, that's just ridiculous because the Bible tells me in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 4 uh, to rejoice again. Again, I say rejoice. In the book of Philippians, you have over and over again that word joy. And how can I have joy when I'm always looking over my shoulder for Satan? How can I possibly have joy if I'm worried every single moment of my life about having to repent of something, and I would answer that by simply saying, by living correctly the best you can and still praying to Almighty God to forgive you of sins. I think that's what brings about our joy. Joy, the way God established it, was not to have joy regardless of whether you have a sin problem or not. The idea of joy is in the, the full context of the meaning is knowing there's something you can do about a sin problem and doing it. And as a result of contacting the blood of Jesus, we have a right to be joyful. The, the Apostle Paul put it this way. He says in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8, and this causes some difficulty for some. It's really not that difficult of a passage when you break it down. For by grace you have been saved. That's not by grace only. Uh, someone said that Martin Luther uh, in his Bible next to Romans 5 and verse 1 says we're justified by faith. He wrote out there sola fide, which means faith only. So there are those who believe in a faith only doctrine. This is not teaching that. For by grace you have been saved through faith. Now listen carefully because I want to come back to this time and time again tonight, time permitting. But what does it mean about this faith? What faith is he talking about? Well, Ephesians 4, 4 through 6, there's that one faith. Now what is that one faith? Well, it's the one faith, according to Romans 10 and verse 17, that comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Why is that important? Because we keep coming back to the idea and the principle of following the Word of God and how that the Word of God, all of it, is important to us. How do I know that? Well, the Bible tells us, 1 Peter 1 and verse 23, we are born again there, not of the water and the blood, but there of the imperishable seed, which is the Word of God. So it's the Word of God and following that that brings about our being born again. Now there's something else. James 1 and verse 21, we're to put away all superfluity of naughtiness or put away all that moral filth and to receive or accept that word of God, listen carefully, which is able to save our souls. Why is that important to us? 
because the Bible tells us we're going to be judged, as we saw this morning, by the Word of God. Because it is that pattern we are to follow in order to be right with Almighty God. But for by grace you have been saved, not in and of itself, through faith, because how are we going to receive the grace of God? That's how I should have started there. How are we to receive the grace of God? Through our faith. How would we lose the grace? By ignoring the faith. How do we receive the faith? Through the Word of God. How do we ignore that faith? By denying the Word of God or living somehow against the Word of God. Why is that important? As I said, because it's part of the being born again process. It's the part of our being saved process. I need to stop looking over there. There's a very blank expression. You guys get to see the good side of me. Okay, here we go. Paul said... And uh, you know, we are, see, I lost my place. We are saved by God's grace, but not by grace alone. We need to understand that. We accept God's grace by having an obedient faith, by obeying God's commands. Now, listen uh, very carefully to this. Grace is God's part, okay? I said this morning, it's His to give. I know from Scripture how we receive it. It's through obedience. Grace is God's part to us, and not a single one of us could ever enter into heaven without the grace of God. But we have to understand, an obedient faith is our part. So there are two parts here, God's part and our part. Just because God is a grace-giving God doesn't mean we get it. Because the way you obtain it is through our obedience. Now, watch carefully this. I'm going to keep turning over there because... That bothers me. Our obedient faith in no way merits our salvation. You know what that means? That means that God doesn't owe us anything, and just because we're obedient doesn't mean we've earned anything. So we look at this. Our obedient faith in no way merits our, or makes us earn salvation, or do we have the right to say, God, now I am so good, it belongs to me. It is simply how we obtain it. Because we are still, even after our obedience, and I, I, you're going to understand this, we're still weak and frail. We're still missions in progress. We still have problems, and we still need to be obedient to every single part of God's will and purpose. Well, let's get to something else. James just tells us how this happens, this idea about our sin problem. Now watch carefully. But each person... And I, I want to break this down. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. See it? Now let's get deeper. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Now, this is interesting to us because James is talking about the type of sin that is caused by a temptation for which we have a strong desire. You know what that means? That means we are enticed. That means that we are tempted in those areas where Satan knows he can get us. He knows us so well, perhaps even better than we even know ourselves. And that's kind of scary. And there's something else that goes along with this. It's frightening. Notice this verse. That this is a sin that when it is fully grown brings forth death. The word thanatos. You know what that means? Separation. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. Our sins separate us from God. I mentioned that this morning. So what this is telling us here is that when it is fully grown, what does that mean? That means there's a progression that goes on. You listening to me? A progression that goes on. That it begins... And then there's a step, another step, another step, another enticement, another step. All of a sudden, you're dragged in and it's too late. You've given in to it. But this is also telling us that every step of the way, we could say no if we wanted to. Every single step of the way, we could walk away from it. But I want you to notice what this is saying. This is why we talk about sin and why I said today, I want all of us, whenever we leave here, 
to take sin more seriously than we ever have in our lives because this is what the Word of God tells us. Whenever it's full grown, it brings about separation. Which sin is it talking about? Each and every one. We're going to see that tonight too. Many believe we can sin and not be aware of it. I'm one of those. I think we can sin and not be aware of it. But let me warn you, I believe that this may happen for those who don't know the Word of God and what it says is sinful. I believe it can also happen to those who profess to be children of God but never get into the Word of God. And I believe it can happen to those individuals all around the world that have never even heard of the Word of God. Okay, now we've established that. There is a way someone can sin and not even know they are doing it. Well, what about those people? What about when that happened? Well, this doesn't mean we're not held accountable for our sins because we are, whether Christian or not, accountable to Almighty God. Isn't that true? Now think about this. We all will face judgment. The fact of an eternal hell means God takes sin very, very seriously. Now, I've had one person say, well, what about people in foreign countries that have never heard the word of God? What about the, the people in, in, in tribes in, in remote parts of, of whether it's China, you know, villages in China, whether it's, it's Africa or South America or wherever it might be? What about those people who have never heard the word of God? Will they be held accountable? I say yes. And we're going to be held accountable for not taking the word of God to them. But let me tell you something. If they're not held accountable, then why do we send missionaries? Now you think about that. If those people over there and you believe they're not accountable for not hearing the word of God, then why would we ever send a missionary to mess them up and cause them to lose their souls? See, it doesn't make any sense. The reality of it is, we are responsible to spread the Word of God, and everyone in the world is responsible for obedience. We may yell all we want to. It doesn't sound fair. It doesn't sound fair. We get to Judgment Day, and God says they never heard the Word of God, and they get to go in. I don't think any of us are going to kick and scream, right? But the point of the matter is, this side of heaven, I can't make that judgment. All I can do is simply say what the Word of God says. We're to preach the Word of God to the entire world and everyone is invited and everyone should be held accountable for their lives and the way they live and the way they don't live. And that's kind of scary too. Let's get to a verse of Scripture here. John said this, and I want to point some things out about this. I've got a lot of things to point out tonight. But if we walk, and I want you to notice that conditional word. I'll get back to that more a little bit later on. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Now hold on to that. Because here's what we like to do. Boy, we like to get to that positive, and I'm, I'm right there with you. The blood of Jesus cleanses us from what? What kind of sin? How many is left out? Oh, none's left out. Now let me ask you another very important question. How many does he take seriously? How many sins need the blood of Jesus? All of them. What sins can we live and incorporate in our lives that God will ignore because of this passage? None. You see, there's always, as I always say, familiar verses need to be read more closely Walk in the light as He is in the light. We have fellowship with one another and the blood of His Son, of Jesus His Son, cleanses us from all sin. Now watch carefully. If we say we have no sin, and I've run across those people. I've never sinned them. I can't think of the last time I sinned. Liar, liar, liar. What do you mean you can't think? And why do I say that? It's a strong word because that's what this says. That's book, chapter, and verse. Get to it. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth. That's the word of God. That was John 17, 17 says, sanctifies us, sets us apart. If we say we have no sin, that means each and every one of us have a need for the blood. Each and every one of us have a need to pray. Each and every one of us from time to time have a need to repent. Isn't that what it says? You don't get me to preach here. You don't start talking up a little bit now. 
Here we go. And the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Meaning, all unrighteousness needs to be confessed, needs to be handled, it needs to be cleansed. I don't care who you are, what you call yourself, there's going to be a sin problem. If we say we have not sinned, we make Him, God, a liar. And His Word is not in us. Wow, what do you mean? His Word's not in us. If we say we haven't sinned, that's a sin problem in and of itself. Because I have to receive that engrafted Word which is able to save my soul. So we look at this. You can't separate Jesus from the Word of God. Now I want to get on to a lot of things here. I may try to skip some of this, but notice the conditional word here, the word if, in the passage we just read. What this means, we must walk in the light, which means we are striving to live our life for God in accordance with His Word. Listen carefully, as 2 Timothy 2.15 says, where it says, do your best to show yourself approved. A workman need not be ashamed, handling the right or accurately the Word of God. This is, means we're striving to live our life for God in accordance with His Word. God, whatever Your Word says, if I am failing to live up to that, give me the courage, the ambition, the desire. As strong as that desire is, and as, as strong as the, the Bible tells me, that the, the sin and, and all that can be and, and that temptation can be, let the desire to live for you be stronger. Father, let me realize why there is something on this earth, an institution known as the ecclesia, the called out, the assembly, the church. Why? Because, Father, we need it. Why are we to, to meet on a weekly basis on the first day of the week? Because, Father, we need it. Why are we to remember the Lord's Supper and the death of our, our Savior? Why? Every Lord's Day, because, Father, that's the focal point. That's why we are what we are. And without it, we couldn't exist. Father, let me never get to a point in my life I take you for granted. We cannot be half-hearted Christians who live like the world and expect to be considered as walking in the light. And it's sad, but and this is, this is that John 7, 24, righteous judgment. I see it. I see people who at one time were strong members of the Lord's body walk back out into the world. They're no longer strong. What happened to them? They still think they're walking in the light when you talk to them. We were listening to, uh, or Vicky was, listening to a, uh, on, a, on the radio some advertisement about a new church in town and how it was talking about this and that and this and that. And you know one thing that was missing? Not one thing in there. They're talking about, oh, we're going to be family oriented. We're going to do this. You know, bring your kids, do all of this. Not one thing about being scripturally correct. One thing about the word. One thing about sin. No, gather together, we're going to have a lot of fun. Am I against having fun? Yes. No, I'm not against having fun. I think the greatest, the greatest thrill of all is knowing the joy of being a Christian and walking in that light and trying to live that way. But you see, there's something I want us to see. I believe that part of walking in the light would certainly include our confessing our sins and repenting of them. I remember gospel meetings and I've told you, I don't make any claims of being a great speaker. I don't make any claims of being a great preacher. And the reason I do that is because I don't have to live up to that. You understand? And the point of that is, but still yet, this old country boy, I used to preach at gospel meetings, and the places would be packed. Packed. And there'd be a, a place where you... Normally their attendance would be 60 and 70. We'd have 150. And people listening to the Word of God. 
and amens are going on and people are responding, people being baptized into Christ, people not afraid to walk down an aisle and say, church, I need your help, I need your prayers. Somehow we've gotten in this fast-paced type of, of lifestyle where I, you know, I don't know how it got here, but it's here. Well, no, now it, it's just not right, or some people just know. I can't, I can't believe that people want to ask the church for prayer. How weak they must be. Well, yes, that's the whole idea of of that that mode of prayer and confessing our sins to one another. We don't have to listen. We don't have to, and I want to say this correctly. We don't have to make a blanket statement to everybody that all of us in here have weak moments. But when someone responds to the gospel invitation, regardless of baptism or repentance, whatever it might be, there ought to be a celebration going on. Now, I'm not talking about hooping and hollering and jumping up and down. I'm talking about a seriousness because there's a soul there that for them, that's the most important time in their lives at that moment. And guess what? That's part of fellowshipping too. It's part of our being involved and it's the greatest thing in all the world. I'll never forget a gospel preacher one time. Somebody got upset. Oh, they were upset. They, because they had driven to hear this gospel preacher. And he preached. And there were like seven or eight, ten responses. I, I happened to be there that day. And the people were upset. Because he wasn't at the back door to meet them and to shake their hand. And I never will forget the response. He told me, he said, look. You're upset and I understand that because I wasn't back there to greet you and you think that was really bad. But I was where the action was. I was where God wanted me to be. Now if you want to shake my hand, that badly come down to where I am. You know, it's only about, you know, 15 step of, yep, journey. I'm getting excited up here now. Part of the difficulty in answering our questions because... I don't know of any Bible that tells us about one person having only one sin in their life or only one sin of which they had to repent, and that's all, and dying right before they repented of it and all of that. But, but you know, I think there are principles here that what we do know is that God is just and merciful, and we know that Jesus is our mediator and has compassion for us because He knows firsthand what it is like to live in the world and be tempted daily. I can't imagine standing before Jesus and having the audacity to try to make some excuse. Can you? Especially in America, especially in today's time. I, I, I can't imagine trying to make an excuse before Him. Lord, you know something? It was hot. And you know something? It was cold. And you know, oh, Sister Cantankerous was there every sermon. And you expect me to be there with her? She just looks at me and I can just tell she just hates me. She just does. And Brother Cantankerous, there he is, never smiles. He just sits back there. Oh, he just, I just tell you, he's just there every time the doors are open. And just so we come up with some of the craziest ideas. Anything from dandruff to flat feet. I just can't be there. Just can't do it. Now, listen to this. I, I don't want to leave on a negative note. I want to read two other parts. Of, well, I'm going to go a little farther than that, so hang with me, sound room. I ain't, I ain't nearly done yet, but we'll get there. Listen to how beautiful this is. And this doesn't mean that sin isn't important. What this means, this is what God will do for those who are obedient. Listen to how beautifully this reads. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will He keep His anger forever. 
He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. We deserve hell. But God's merciful for those who are obedient. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is the steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west. Now watch this last part. So far does he remove our transgressions from us. Why? How? Those who are obedient to him. God, are you going to overlook sin only for those individuals who have been baptized into Christ and the blood covers them? Then I'll remember them no longer. Look at this other part that I want to get to, the last part I want to get to. I'm always going to get someplace. You notice that? Psalm 103, 13 and 14. As the Father shows compassion to His children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear Him. Now this type of fear is not the knee-shaking fear. It's the type of fear where it's reverence and awe. Now watch this last part. For He knows our frame. In other words, He built us. Got me again. He remembers that we are dust. Marshall Keeble used to say, one of my favorite preachers of all time, man, if you don't think you're dirt, just die. <laughs> Notice what this says to us. Quit! <laughs> Boy, talk about a creature of habit, but here we go. I want to show you Next couple of minutes, and we're going to close. While there are always consequences to sin, God does not always give us what we deserve because of His mercy. Do I believe Judgment Day we're going to be shown mercy? Absolutely. Do I need all the grace I can get? Absolutely. Amen and amen. Do I believe because God gives grace we ought to take sin lightly? No, and that's what this sermon's all about. Do I believe we ought to take God for granted and just simply say, well, God's grace is going to handle that. Don't worry about it. I can't do that. Hope I never get to a point where I do that. That's taking God for granted. It's making a mockery of the cross because the Bible I read says we can live in such a way where there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin. We read that this morning, right? That sacrifice for sin is what Jesus did. But we should never have the attitude that God is going to ignore our sins because He will not. Maybe it would help uh, for us to see how powerful one sin really is. I want to show you. I'm not going to give book, chapter, and verse, but I just want to tell you how powerful is one sin. Well, let's look at this for just a second. One sin separated Adam and Eve from the tree of life. One sin caused Cain to kill Abel. One sin caused Lot's wife to be turned into a pillar of salt. One sin caused a young prophet to be eaten by a lion because he believed a lie. One sin caused Moses not to enter the promised land. One sin caused Ananias and Sapphira to be put to death instantly in Acts chapter 5. One sin caused Jesus to be betrayed and caused Judas to hang himself. One sin. Now those sins were also different types of sins, which tells us and preaches and teaches us even a different doctrine, or a different message, that all sin is serious. So as we close today, let me ask the question, what sin do you want to carry with you at judgment? Is there something you're so stubborn about that you won't ask for forgiveness, you won't admit you made a mistake, and you will leave this earth and be judged for that hard-headedness? Is there someone here tonight that needs to be baptized into Christ, but because of your stubbornness you're not going to do it? Someone here thinking, I have plenty of time. Nothing's going to happen to me. Queen Elizabeth, on her deathbed, you know what she said? 
all of my millions for an inch of life. Charlemagne, whenever he was buried, and I told you this, was buried sitting up on a throne, Bible in his lap, from what I read in history, with his finger pointed to a verse of Scripture that says, What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? Isn't that powerful? And he thought about it and made that statement most likely too late. Maybe someone here today, someone here tonight, needs to respond to the gospel invitation. Won't you come as we stand and sing?